Chapter Ten: The Relics. One thing Lem knew intimately after all his time on this earth was that as soon as you start getting used to a bug in their ways, they were guaranteed to change things up on you. Following that logic, instead of flouncing off to their next adventure after breaking and entering into Lem's own home, the knight has the nerve to just not leave. He's not even conscious right now, Lem says. The sound of clinking charms and rustling paper as the knight rearranges their inventory remains as constant as ever. Lem can't tell if the knight has noticed him. You could leave and bring back a sack full of relics before he even finished napping. The knight pauses, flips their map over to the other side, keeps scribbling. Lem grumbles under his breath, tapping impatiently on the counter. Ugh! Does no one have respect for the sanctity of a bug's home any more? No, we're all just going to make ourselves warm and cozy in my shop, the shop for me, the shop I built for me to live in intentionally for myself, to be alone without others, nobody else, especially not wanderers, relic seekers only, but specifically Lem the relic seeker in particular. The knight punctuates their sentence with a period, and keeps writing. Lem could be talking to the memorial to the Hollow Knight for all their reactions. Ugh, how much scribbling can you even do on one map? The knight actually pauses this time. They turn to face Lem slowly, smoothly, giving the impression that maybe their neck could go all the way around like a haunted doll. Well, says Lem. The knight tilts their head to one side in a considering sort of fashion. After a while, they hop down from the chair that they had somehow dragged out of the kitchen and into the front room, and walk briskly over to Lem's counter. They jump up, of course getting their grimy feet all over everything, and lay out their precious map before Lem. <whistles> you certainly get around. The map fills every inch of the parchment. Caverns and tunnels sketched out in simple yet intricate detail, pockmarked with pins of various symbols and colors. The knight watches Lem's face as he scans the map for landmarks or pathways he could recognize offhand. They remain as expressionless as ever, and yet Lem feels their nail-sharp focus on his neck. His eyes, luckily, land on a small doodle near the center of the map. The curved horns of the figure can only be the plaza that houses the Hollow Knight Memorial statue. From there, familiar corridors slot into the places the map implies, though the knight does appear to have missed some key shortcuts and side streets. Lem reaches for the map. I'll pay a 600 geo for this, says Lem. The knight smacks his hand away. Ah, you could have just said no. Your map isn't even entirely accurate. Lem says sourly. If you'd taken a left here, you'd have avoided fighting through the spire entirely, you know. The knight, expression unchanging, stares Lem down. They do not adjust their map in any fashion. Fine. Be wrong. Lem traces his usual path to Blue Lake, pausing on the knight's doodles of cars in the elevator shafts. They're oddly detailed. The trip itself, Lem knew, was an all-day sort of excursion, considering it was a round trip. Moving around that many husks, even avoiding the more concentrated areas, took a lot of care. Lem thought of that as a pretty significant journey. The map, in its entirety, was nearly the size of Lem's desk. The distance from Lem's shop to the Blue Lake is less than the length of his finger. By contrast, the shaky path Lem traces from what could only be a pin mark in his shop, up through the apartments, out of the city entirely, through the fungal wastes, and into Fog Canyon, landing on the distinct image of the teacher's archive, the longest journey Lem had taken since he first found his shop in Hollow Nest, was only a small piece of this map. Not nothing, of course. Lem would balk if Hollow Nest was truly that vast. But when he spreads his hand... It more than encompasses the distance. Lem's world, in that moment, feels unspeakably small, and he'd been spending years in this tiny, tiny space. The knight, who has made no feelings on Lem's study of their map whatsoever, either hasn't noticed any of this, or simply possesses a truly frightening patience at the most inconvenient times. 
Lem grunts. <clears throat> well, it's a fine map, I'll give you that. Easily the most thorough I've seen of Hollow Nest in its current form. I've seen more than a few travelers' maps in my day. A small hand, black as pitch, pats lightly at the map on the counter. Lem is not entirely sure what the knight is trying to say, but he nods, and they seem to appreciate that. 700 Geo. The knight stares at him. <laughs> Whatever. Lem can get another map off someone else's corpse later. What's this? Lem says, pointing to the little pins shaped like faces. The knight shrugs. So there are other people in this old husk of a kingdom. Make any friends? The knight points to the next room. Huh, so that's how you know him. You travel together, then? They shake their head. Ugh, you traveling types in love with a solo journey, I swear. Hasn't it ever occurred to you to find a traveling partner? Maybe you would all stop dying so often if you did. The knight's not listening. They peel off a series of blue pins from the corner of the map and plunk them down in various spots. In the middle of Deep Nest, the City of Tears, all the way up in the Forgotten Crossroads, Mantis Village, the Teacher's Archive. Then they point to the other room again. Oh, how Lem enjoys these little charade games. You traveled with Quirrell in those places. The knight shakes their head. You traveled alone in those places. The knight shakes their head. You found a traveling partner in those places? The knight shakes their head. Ugh, you didn't have a traveling partner and died in those places. The knight makes a so-so gesture. You- ugh, Wait, what the heck is that supposed to mean? The knight points to the other room again. You met him at those places. The knight nods. There's a lot of blue pins, which is impressive in its own right, that the knight and Coral crossed paths so frequently when hollowness was so vast. The distance between the blue pins is ridiculous. Lem's hand doesn't cover even half of it. And for the knight to meet Coral at all those locations meant that Coral had been in all those locations. Lem feels maybe a little stupid just then, because he'd known intellectually that Quarrel had traveled the world, but it was one thing to know that, and another thing entirely to see the path Quarrel had walked on a map. Lem wonders if either the knight or Quarrel bothered to make a map of the world outside Hollow Nest, what it might look like to trail blue pins all the way across that map. How many handspans worth it would take to cover all the places and roads and kingdoms in the world? <laughs> what a load of trouble! All that walking! Why? To see some dirt? Lem's got dirt under his desk right now. For what? For the vibrancy in Quirrell's face as he led them through Fog Canyon? For the joy in his voice when he spoke of all the places he'd seen and been? Like Lem said, what? A load of trouble. Great, says Lem. Good for you. Travel the length, made a nice map, saw the sights, been there, done that. Now what? The knight doesn't move. You had your big fancy journey. You did everything there is to do. Been to the teacher's archive. Lem glares at that blue pin in particular. You go home, don't you? That's what you do when you're done traveling, isn't it? The knight does not respond to that, either. So, where's home for you? The knight shakes their head. What do you mean, no? Where'd you come from? The knight shakes their head. Don't give me that! You didn't just pop out of the ground! Wherever you came from, that's your home, isn't it? The knight shakes their head. Ugh, you traveling types, says Lem again, disparagingly. All the same. Can't tell you the number of outcast runaways and orphans I've seen coming through Hollow Nest. Suppose nobody will miss them anyway. The knight looks off towards the other room again. I didn't mean him. That one's just crazy. Only mad people like traveling like he does. Coral has been all over that map, practically from end to end. For what? For fun? Unbelievable. Lem scoffs and looks away over the knight's head, directly at the window behind Lem's desk, where Quirrell used to stand for hours on end, staring out the window, pacing the length of the shop like a restless animal. 
Ridiculous, you traveling types, says Lem absently. Who ever heard of someone who couldn't stay in one place? Where you come from is where your home is, you know, and your home is who you are. Lem came straight out of his own relic shop. True fact, no really. One day a shop got set up in an abandoned apartment in the city of tears, full of knickknacks and anything else Lem thought was interesting, and then Lem appeared, and he's been there ever since. If Lem adventures a dangerous trip to Watcher's Spire and its infected residents, he knows where he goes after that. Back home, to where he belongs, where the husks won't bother him. If Lem goes fishing in the royal waterways, he knows where he's going to hoard all the relics he finds. If Lem finds some hooligan trying to drown himself in the blue lake, Lem knows where he goes after that. Home, presumably with hooligan in tow, where Lem knows exactly where he can stay and where he can eat, and where they'll both be able to close the doors against the rain and the tides, close the doors, close the windows, let the sound of time pass by while the shop remains untouched. The center of the universe is the Relic Seeker shop, where all old and wandering relics pass through and live again. You can't put a price on something like that, a staple in the world that you can always go back to, no matter where you go or what you do. Take the staple out, everything falls apart. The entire map disintegrates. Lem likes the things that travelers come to sell him, but he doesn't trust anyone who can't tell him where they came from. You can't just not have a place you came from. How else will you know where you'll go back to? And if you don't know where you're going, how can you know anything at all? A name is just a word. A home is what you are. Travelers go around thinking they can exist without a home, without a place they came from. It's nonsense. Absolute bull. The height of self-delusion in Lem's opinion. But it doesn't matter to Lem. Travelers always leave, and Lem always stays right here. And it matters very little in the end. The other downside to traveling, aside from the multitude of downsides Lem could already list even before the trip to the archive, was that when he returned home, everything had a thin layer of dust. Not a thick layer, they had only been gone for a few days, although it was sometimes difficult to tell in Hollow Nest, certainly less than two weeks. The shop was not suddenly filled with cobwebs or the smell of mildew, but the shine had gone from some of his relics, and that wasn't a situation Lem could leave alone. So, when Coral starts complaining, politely as he does, about Lem's enforced bed rest, Lem gets out the cleaning supplies. Coral's so glad just to stand up and walk around that he dusts the king's idols with what looks like actual joy. His wounds are still dressed, but on bed rest and a steady diet of soups, they heal a bit every day. Coral's half mask stands out as the worst of the damage now. Everything else is healing or scarring over into sturdy shell. The knight contributes by getting out of the way. If standing in one place just long enough to test Lem's patience, only to move at the last second, counts as contributing. It's childish. It's frightfully domestic. Lem sweets with some unnecessary vigor, sending more particles into the air than into the pile he's ostensibly making. The knight sneezes. Lem sticks the broom under his desk, trying to get at the dirt that's collected under it, knocking it against the wood as he does. The knight hops up onto the desk itself, as if knowing instinctively while they'll be both out of the way and yet irritatingly in Lem's face simultaneously. Lem retaliates by banging the handle of his broom into the desk as often as he can pass off as accidental. Do you want some help? Coral says absently. I know what I'm doing. This'll get it just as clean without me getting all sorts of nonsense in my beard, Lem says, just as his broom bangs into something shelved into the furthest corner under his desk. He drags it closer with the handle of his broom. What on earth? (laughs) Why do I have a bag of rocks under my desk? Good God, it's the nonsense I've allowed to collect in the shop. Now, would you like some help? Lem dumps the bag of rocks on the top of the desk. Two seconds too late, the knight moves out of the way. Yes, yes, we can sort through it when we've got the time. 
By the time the floor's clean, the knights got their entire face in the bag of stones and is slowly excavating its grimy, dirty contents onto Lem's desk. Ah, oh, wonderful! Shall we add washing the desk to the list of chores? Says Lem. Quirrell picks up a rock. What are we doing with these? Cracking it open. See what's inside. Throw it out if there's nothing. Archaeology? My expertise was never artifacts. Is there a special approach the professional relic seeker might suggest? For half a moment, Lem faces the unshakable feeling Quirrell is mocking him. But the truly miraculous thing is that it only lasts half a moment. Quirrell looks at Lem with sincere interest. Of course Quirrell isn't being cruel. Lem knows that. Hit it really hard with a hammer! says Lem. The knight nods in firm agreement. What have you been breaking open rocks? Lem says. The knight stares at Lem as if he is asking the most foolish question ever uttered. Quirrell frowns slightly. But what happens if this rock we crack apart does contain some small relic? Wouldn't it be broken? It's not an arcane egg, Quirrell. It doesn't come apart in layers. It's a rock, says Lem grumpily, and then adds, we would never have known about it unless we broke it open anyway. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. The first rock does not split into precise halves, but the layers separate into discrete pieces almost easily. The leverage Lem uses to remove the chisel pops the thinner top piece clear off the bottom. Lem glares at it. He's tempted to go at the rest of the rocks at that very moment. But Quirrell glides into place next to him and takes a larger piece out from under him. <laughs> Remarkable! They certainly have weight to them, but that weight has provided them no strength. Quirrell examines the rock from a few angles, squinting at it. I assumed that a heavier rock must be a strong one before now. He lowers the rock to the knight's level to allow them a look of their own. From what I recall, that's most often true, Lem says, leaving the hammer and chisel on his desk. Another rare strangeness of many down here in the depths of Hollow Nest. Lem turns and scowls at the smaller rock piece. Cracking it open has revealed a series of layers differentiated by small variations in color. But amongst the layers, one bit is not aligned with the rest. Lem squints at it, reaching for his second smallest magnifying glass. Quirrell, have a look at this. Have you discovered something? Quirrell says, sounding rather interested in that darnedly honest way of his. Tch, no guarantee. Here, with a magnifying glass. Lem hands it off to Quirrell. In that section, see how it curves into the other layers? Indeed, and it is an exact match for this half. Quirrell demonstrates by showing Lem the distinctly matching curve. What do you suppose caused it? How would I know? I study relics, not rocks. But... He squints. Perhaps if you used a more delicate pick to pry that section out from the surrounding stone... Quirrell is already setting to work on the larger piece. Lem debates leaving him to it briefly, but finds himself sitting down with a smaller half and a pick of his own. It's mindless, soothing work, and Lem loses himself in the familiar groove of a task that requires some focus, but not so much it becomes exhausting. The sound of the rain, and Quirrell working diligently on his own piece of stone, only adds to the effect. While they work, the knight sorts the rocks, first from smallest to largest, then by color, and finally, by some categorization, Lem has no inkling of. The piece is separate from the rest of the rock, or at least separate enough that it doesn't take much aside from diligent picking to remove it from the surrounding stone. When Lem wipes the dust away, he's left with a small brown rock with strange, distinct ridges on its surface. Lem squints at it, trying to recall if stones could be formed into that shape naturally. Lem, are you finished? I got the piece out, if that's what you mean, but I don't have a clue what it could possibly be. When Lem turns, Quirrell is still diligently working on his larger piece, having pried away about half of the stone. Perhaps a more complete picture will be more illuminating. I wouldn't get my hopes up. Lem turns his chair to more fully watch Quirrell work. Rocks contain, most often, more rock. It would be ridiculously lucky to find something in the very first stone. You never know, Lem. Good fortune can strike at any time. Lem humps. 
It can, but it most certainly doesn't. The rock is still covered in dust when Quirrell's finished with it, but Lem can clearly see the same ridges that mark the other piece. The knight, satisfied with her sorting efforts, leans in close. Lem hands him the dust rag, and Quirrell gets to wiping away the dusty excess. Perhaps a stone shaped by some forces deeper below ground? Quirrell idly speculates. There are many things it could be, so let's get a better look and more information. There's a strange excitement in the air, bolstered by the knight leaning closer and closer all the time. Finally, Quirrell removes the cloth and reveals the shape that they have excavated from the stone. It's... Huh. Is this a geo? Lem leans in close. Hmm. Huh. It's not any of the official denominations, and it certainly hasn't been properly standardized. But that is indeed one of the fossils used as geo. The fossil is about a hand span long, a bit like a five geo piece, but too wide for the standard shape. The distinctive ridges march up the length in thin, steady increments before meeting up with a round half-circle piece that Lem theorizes is an armored head. Lem's piece is a chunk taken out of the back end, but it's along one of the ridges, easily fixed and even more easily disguised. What a life this little creature must have led, and yet here it is, waiting to be found in a stone on the shore of the Blue Lake, Coral says, because of course he does. Yes, yes, how poetic, Lem says. Fossils aren't exactly rare around here. There's a reason they're standard currency. Hold on. Blue Lake? I assume so, says Quirrell, confused at Lem's confusion. Don't you remember? The knight reaches gently for the geo piece, and Quirrell obliges their curiosity. As they hold it, they look at it even more intensely, as if they could reveal its secrets if they just stood there and glared at it long enough. <laughs> Sorry, my friend, says Quirrell. It's not exactly standard currency. It doesn't look like it's worth anything but the pleasure of discovering it. Blue Lake? Lem thinks. And then, as if on cue, the stones Quirrell had at the Blue Lake when they'd first met, the stones that Lem brought back under the pretense that they'd break them open at his shop just for an excuse to drag Quirrell back with him, and then promptly forgot about because he'd assumed they wouldn't have anything in them worth discovering. Those stones. The knight hands the piece back to Quirrell and then goes to the coffee table. They look up and down their line of carefully sorted rocks. They select one. Then they hold it out for Quirrell as if in a question. Of course, says Quirrell, like the knight really had spoken and takes the offering. Who knows what other small wonders we'll find. Lem was made for the Relic Seeker shop. To have made yourself is a stroke of the only fortune that anyone could ever ask for. When other people get their grubby mitts into your origin story, everything goes to heck. Suddenly you're making decisions based off what someone else might want to do if they had the right to control your life. Worse yet, you might do it willingly. A creature like Lem couldn't have been made anywhere but in a relic shop, anyhow. So Lem thinks that Lem's sudden appearance in his own shop makes perfect sense. Someone like him could never have been the product of a small town on the side of the road, tucked into a mountain face near the salt mines. The obsessiveness with which Lem collects fossils, trash, old bits of some long past era could never have been the natural conclusion of any normal sort of town. <laughs> Such a hermit would have been an anomaly, bordering on the impossible, bordering on the rumored, a source of village gossip, a conversation piece as people wondered how any sane person could ever devote himself completely, day and night, to a pile of old trash he dug up out of the ground. How extremely fortunate that such a thing never happened, and therefore nobody ever disappeared from the village outskirts one day without a warning or farewell, and nobody walked every step of the road alone out of fear of having to hold a conversation with anyone he hitchhiked with, and nobody ever resolved themselves that it was better to be himself and alone than someone else and surrounded with people he never cared for anyway. You see, 
There's nothing quite like doing work you love. Lem thinks that maybe people don't realize that, but happiness is no thing of its own. Happiness is certainly not other people, that's for certain. It's a byproduct of doing whatever ridiculous hobby you willingly choose on a rainy day with no other plans. Nothing brings Lem joy like sitting down with someone else's account of Hollow Nest. There were only ever two legends from Hollow Nest's golden era that Lem didn't love. These are also the only two legends he rereads. The first is the legend of the Hollow Knight, forgotten to this day seemingly with great intention, since there was simply no other explanation for why there was never any record of them. Could there? A great sacrifice and a memorial for their loss, and yet done completely without thanks. Did the common public even know of them when they'd been alive? Had they toiled their whole life in silence and service and gone out the same way? What kind of dedication must it have required to have done all that without even a glimpse of approval from anyone else? What kind of love? The second is the legend of the teacher's archive. There are very few records of the archive itself, plenty of the research that it churned out, but less so about what the archive was like back in its heyday. Lem would say he knows more about the archive than he does the Hollow Knight by a technicality. The technicality's name is Quirrell. He assumes it was a research facility of some sort from circumstantial evidence and a gut feeling. He knows what the script looks like, but not a single one of the people who wrote it. He knows they collected knowledge, passed it on, kept it safe, and recorded every odd fact and scrap of trivia. Lem does not often commit himself to strong opinions without strong data, but he is sure that the archive must have been a wonderful place. He is almost certain that such a place could only have been made by strange, obsessive types who hold themselves up on the outskirts of Fog Canyon and wouldn't know how to be less obsessed with odd knowledge and mysterious artifacts if it bit them on the nose. He is almost certain that anyone who'd been there would agree with him. If there is such a thing as self, or happiness, or contract, or service, they are nothing compared to doing the work you love. Eventually, the knight goes about a great show of strapping their nail on their back, collecting all their loose odds and ends into their mysterious cloak, and parading across the room to the door. It all rings of performance. If the strange bug had wanted to leave, Lem is certain they would have done so, without a word or sign. He assumes they're doing that game of charades again to make their point, but Lem hasn't the faintest what that point might be. Lem, have you seen? Quirrell stops, midway through emerging from the back room. Ah, are you leaving then? The knight nods once. I wish you good luck on your travels, my friend. Perhaps we shall see each other again soon? The knight looks down at the floor, not in shame or embarrassment, but in deep thought. When they look up again, they point at Quirrell insistently. Well, I think I'll stay here a bit longer, if that's what you mean. The knight tilts their head, as if this doesn't make sense, or as if Quirrell has lied, and the knight is offering a chance to correct it. Good luck, my friend, Quirrell says instead. You said that already, says Lem. A traveler can never have too much luck. Lem grunts. Then to the knight he says, Well, off you go. Surely you've done enough loitering. Lem waves them off. Shoo, shoo, and be sure to come back with some relics. Lem hadn't meant to say that, except there was nothing wrong with saying that, was there? Of course Lem wants the knight to return. Their sales make up a significant portion of the collection now. It'd be good for the shop to see Lem's most frequent, and apparently indestructible, patron again. Lem's got no business feeling like he's confessed to something terrible. The knight, for their part, looks at Lem for a long moment. They make no indication whatsoever that they've heard him. Instead, they turn, leave, and quietly shut the door behind them. Quirrell stands there for a moment, and before anything else can happen, before Quirrell can retreat, before Lem can let his cowardice get in the way, he says, You didn't have to turn them down. You can go if you'd like. Quirrell looks at Lem as though he has caught him in a trap or spotted him committing some small crime, it's a frozen, accused look, but he does not leap to his denials quite fast enough. Whatever gave you the idea that I wanted to leave? 
<laughs> Besides literally everything Quirrell had ever done, the waxing poetic about traveling, the joy he had on even the short trip to Fog Canyon, give Lem a break. Fine, don't leave then, says Lem. I'm just reminding you that there's no reason why you can't, says Lem, and tucks his face into his beard in the pretense of examining a wanderer's journal. You're not my employee. You don't owe me anything. God forbid. We never had a contract or a deal beyond helping out with a shop if you stuck around. And need I remind you, I'm perfectly capable of running this shop alone. Now Quirrell's got his arms crossed. Lem isn't quite sure what he's saying wrong. If he's saying anything wrong at all. He can't be. Quirrell's love of travel is plain as day. Lem's got no intention of standing between a bug and the things he loves to do. I'm just saying, says Lem. You're free to stay. You're free to go. Just like that, Quirrell says, as if the idea was unthinkable. Guilt, in Lem's estimation, is the most useless emotion a bug can possess. Here, now, what was Quirrell's guilt providing him? Nothing but the notion that Quirrell must feel regretful about something he is going to do anyway. Or, worse yet, that Quirrell must feel regretful about doing something he should do. Quirrell would grow miserable trapped here, down in the dark, in a city tainted with so many ghosts and memories. He would wilt like a plant without the sun. Why not? Lem asks. I bet you've already got a list of places you'd like to visit, don't you? Quirrell brightens despite himself. Well, of course. Did you know there was a traveler here some time ago? She is the one I bought all that flatware from. She talked of a place called Snowy Shore, and the way she described it, Lem. I feel like I have dreamed of it vividly, and yet I cannot properly recall if I have ever been there. This feeling of curiosity won't let me rest. Honest excitement lights up Quirrell's entire frame. He almost shines with it, a different light entirely than the misted lanterns of the city, or the bioluminescent glow of the archive, or the ugly infected light of the husks. Is it strange that it fills me with such excitement? And all the places I heard in passing during my travels before, they clamor in my head like so many chimes. I already told you of Forest Roost, of Salt Springs, but not Snowy Shore, or the Golden Spires, or Red Drop Pass, because I have only heard stories of those places, stories on the road, and stories here. I keep thinking, if I went there myself, I could see if the stories are true, make the stories real, make a few stories of my own to tell. Quirrell trails off in thought. Lem sinks into his own shell. How very well and good all these exciting and fascinating places Quirrell's only heard rumors of, has no solid information about, and could very well get himself killed trying to find. They clamor in Lem's head, but not so much like chimes at all. Lem says nothing about it. If nothing else, Lem's stubborn and set in his ways and unchanging. Everyone and everything moves around him, without him, until he finally came to a place that was dead. Even the husks moved in unchanging patterns. Quirrell is just another bug moving on and changing, and Lem is being his stubborn, unchanging self. Just how it should be. Say, says Quirrell, Lem, what? Quirrell looks at him evenly. Say that I did want to go. Say that I did want to travel again. Are you going to insist on speaking in a hypothetical? Because I've got better things to do than talk around something for the sake of courtesy. Or, gods forbid, feelings. Lem would like to continue his stellar track record of doing nothing for the sake of feelings. Say that I did want to travel again. Say that I did want to go back and see the places I haven't been to yet in Hollownest. And there's still quite a few left in Hollownest alone, actually. And then a few places I didn't even know I hadn't been to yet. Say I wanted to make my way all the way to the depths of Deep Nest to visit the Mask Maker. The who? 
The point is the hypotheticals I'm speaking in for the sake of courtesy, says Quirrell. Disgusting, says Lem. Continue. <laughs> it's come to my attention of late that some tasks must be done alone. Pilgrimages, for example, or quests to find some long-lost truth. But I'll be doing neither of the sort from now on. You're right. If I travel again, when you travel again, if I travel again, it'll be done for my own reasons, as I have no other reasons left after all. A tremendous advantage, Lem replies instinctively. I would not have agreed with you a month ago. Coral looks Lem in the eyes, broken mask to meet his. It is entirely your fault that I do now. So, if I'll travel on my own terms, I see no reason now why I have to travel alone. If you run, you might be able to catch it with that little night friend of yours. Go make them be your travel buddy. That might be bad for my injuries, says Quirrell dryly. Besides, there's already someone I've traveled with before, right here. It takes Lem a second to put that one together. Oh, what? says Lem, almost offended. Quirrell snorts. <laughs> Why the surprise? When we went to the archive, I didn't mind your company. Nonsense! I slowed you down, got us lost, made a ruckus, complained every step of the way. I'd be awful to travel with. Good God, you'd be stuck with me and my grouchiness for days on end. Think about what you're saying. We're already stuck together for days on end, and I don't particularly mind, says Quirrell. We are not. You're free to go whenever you like. And I already knew about you and your grouchiness, and I don't mind that either, Quirrell goes on. So you should know very well that I'd be the worst possible person to travel with. It's only a suggestion, Quirrell says, in that mild tone of voice that signifies that he's made up his mind and is rather abusing the definition of the word suggest. You need not take it too seriously or think much of it. Good, says Lem angrily, that I won't. Anger boils up Lem's blood, and words emerge from him like its kettle whistling violent steam. Traveling? Me? Where to? Why? So we can all go to heck and we can part ways in the middle of nowhere out of frustration? The idea is ludicrous. And my shop, Coral, my relics, it's my life's work in here, and you'd have me abandon everything I've collected on a half-cocked adventure that'll get us both killed sooner rather than later? Please, I don't invest in nonsense fairy tales. Go find a travel partner if you'd like one, but don't bring me into it! Goodness, Lem, it was only a suggestion. Quirrell sounds genuinely surprised. I, I know how much your shop means to you. I should hope so. There's nothing in that shop I didn't collect myself. This shop took years to build, tailored to exactly every odd interest I ever liked, every nice piece of furniture I ever fancied, down to the rain on the window pane. And the best part of it all is that it's safe, it's quiet, it's sedentary, and I don't have to put up with anyone else. There's a long silence. The moment Quirrell says, It was only a suggestion, Relic Seeker, is the same moment Lem realizes he ruined it. Quirrell's tone has taken on a stiff formality, as if they're strangers again. Lem has been here before. He hasn't been here for a long time, not since before he came to Hollow Nest. But he knows this place, this feeling, the familiarity of other people's disappointment. You knew this was coming, Lem thinks. This is what happens every time you try to deal with other people. Why are you so surprised? Yes, well, only a suggestion. There's... Lem struggles valiantly for words. Why is it so difficult now? when they flowed like the water outside just moments ago. There's no harm done by suggestions. Right. Carl did no harm here. His suggestion didn't do anything but provide Lem an opening to make the same mistakes Lem can't seem to help himself from making over and over and over. Coral is finally standing, 
arms loose at his sides. Lem can't read his expression. I had no idea I was such a burden on you. See, the trouble is that by all accounts, all logical sense, all the metrics Lem had previously used to measure his life and accomplishments, Quirrell should be a burden. He should be an impossibly thorough distraction from his purpose, the study and collecting of relics, everything Lem has devoted himself to since before the shop he now stands in. Quirrell dropped unceremoniously into his world, and his past and infection took over entire swaths of Lem's time. Days, weeks, months of time he could have been devoting to tricky projects or the truly magnificent wealth of relics the knight has provided for him. Quirrell has been, as Lem put it earlier, standing between a bug and the things he loves to do. So why can't Lem bring himself to call Quirrell a burden? He cannot even bring himself to call Quirrell a distraction. Lem brought Quirrell into his shop himself and has worked hard to keep him there. Worse, he's worked hard to keep him alive and happy. And in the meantime, his relics languished. That's not a matter of burden. I don't get along with other people, Lem says gruffly. Surely you already knew that. Lem doesn't look up, which is why he sees clearly as Quirrell's hands clench in frustration on Lem's desk. I already told you that I don't mind, Quirrell replies. It seems like the only person here who minds is you. Very much so, says Lem. It doesn't take very long after that for Quirrell's hypothetical travel plans to become unhypothetical. Lem knew that would happen. All travelers are the same, can't sit still, always gallivanting around, homeless on the road, until they disappear into some foreign grave. Well, Lem's a stubborn old coot, and he won't go back on his word. If that's what makes Quirrell happy, Lem will be happy to see him go. It's for the best. Quirrell's obsession with visiting exotic patches of dirt is probably what Quirrell lives for anyway, and it'd be nonsense to have kept Quirrell alive long enough just to deny him the things he wants to live for. Quirrell is an exemplary house guest to the end. When he goes, the shop is cleaner than when Quirrell moved in. The kitchen is spotless and restocked and the little corner where he'd kept his belongings is swept and empty. It was only a week ago that Quirrell had actually unpacked. Quirrell ties his headscarf around his head again, neatly tucked around his broken half-mask. His movements are so perfunctory that Lem feels a bit like he's watching a customer tie off a business transaction. The first stop will most definitely have to be the mask maker says Quirrell, in such a cool sort of voice that makes Lem wonder why he's even telling Lem where he's going. They're in Deep Nest, if you've ever been. Lem grunts. He'd joke about how he's not the traveling type, but this seems like a uniquely unkind comment to make at the current moment. Quirrell picks up his nail with a look of strange ambivalence, then his tiny pack of supplies. He hesitates. If everything goes according to plan, Quirrell tells Lem, I could visit everywhere I've been meaning to in Hollow Nest in a month. I think, for my own reasons, I'd like to see the Blue Lake one last time before I leave Hollow Nest for good. Oh, you've decided on leaving Hollow Nest then? I didn't come to Hollow Nest to leave it half seen, says Quirrell, but I suppose I also didn't come to Hollow Nest to stay either. To my own surprise, it seems that I've got the rest of my life to go elsewhere. Good for Quirrell, Lem thinks. If anyone deserves to get out of this graveyard, it's him. Then Quirrell hesitates again, which is twice in a row. Lem's never known him to be such a hesitant type. I won't bother you again if you'd rather be left alone, says Quirrell at last. But if our paths were to cross once more at the Blue Lake... I'd be quite happy if this conversation isn't the last we'll have. 
The idea that Quirrell might willingly want to spend more time with him is so strange that it's nearly repulsive. Lem has no idea what expression he's making. I'll... I'll think about it. Quirrell nods once and waves, and then he is opening the door, and then he is closing the door, and then he is gone. Just like that, Quirrell had said when Lem suggested that he could leave. He'd sounded surprised, like it shouldn't be that easy to pick up and leave. The door remains shut. Lem sits back down at his desk. The rain pours outside. Eventually, Lem stands up and reopens the door, like he might expect to see Quirrell standing there, as he used to in one of his odd trances. The hallway is long and empty. Quirrell is gone. Just like that, then. Well, Lem is happy for him, he supposes. It was obvious from the start that Quirrell had one love of his life, and it was travel. Better to get the pining over with and get Quirrell back to the traveling he so obviously adores. Speaking personally, there's very few things in this world that Lem despises so much as unnecessary prolonged pining when everyone could just get over themselves and get on with it, so thank the gods that's over with. Now Lem can go back to his usual solitary ways before he ever brought home any strange bugs from the shore of the Blue Lake. The day after Quirrell leaves, Lem visits the Hollow Knight's memorial again. It's the same as it always is. Tall, silent, and soaking wet. Lem studies the plaque again, like he used to, with concentration uninterrupted by any pesky roommates and their drama. And he doesn't have to share his umbrella, either. He gets to stand in the middle of the downpour, completely untouched by the rain, like he used to. I suppose you must have thought you were doing the right thing, Lem tells the Hollow Knight's statue. I suppose it's always hard to willingly lose things if you don't think it's the right thing to do. Nobody likes losing things, which is why sacrifice is oh so noble, probably. Like how loss is noble, or grief. People think pain is cute when it's on other people. The statue remains as it always was, silent, rain-soaked, and a terrible conversation partner. I suppose you must have never had any doubts to go through with it, Lem tells them. That must have been nice.